It took billions of years for the Earth to carve the oceans into the pattern we know today. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution and adaptation have resulted in the creation of countless species that interact to form the largest ecosystem on the planet. Deep in the ocean blue, every species has a role, its own specific function, in a delicate balance among all species. From time immemorial, mankind has fished for survival. The never-ending challenge is how to share the sea's resources with other species that depend on them. Increasingly sophisticated commercial fishing practices using advanced technologies have in the last 50 years dramatically improved marine harvesting. We keep going farther and deeper and catching more and more fish. But we seem to have reached the limit. The ocean's ability to meet human nutritional needs is being exhausted, a result of decades of overfishing and abuse. Scientists consider that if nothing is done rapidly to correct the situation, we will see the collapse of commercial fishing within the next few decades. Yet over a billion people depend directly on the sea for survival. The future of many societies may well hinge on whatever conservation measures we are prepared to introduce over the next years. As part of its mission, 1,000 Days for the Planet, the oceanographic schooners Setna 4 set sail for Indonesia, a country of more than 17,000 islands where many villages depend on fishing for their food and livelihood. Chief of Mission, Jean Lemire. We're heading to Bali, an exotic island surrounded by coral reefs, known for its remarkable marine biodiversity. Located in the heart of what we call the Coral Triangle, the islands of Indonesia harbor 76% of all species of coral. These reefs provide shelter and food to 37% of all the coral-dwelling fish on Earth. This amazing variety of species has led to a thriving commerce in aquarium fish. It's a lucrative business valued at around $1 billion annually, all categories combined. Of the 40 countries that export tropical fish, Indonesia and the Philippines supply at least 85% of ocean fish to the world's aquariums. The market for tropical fish skyrocketed after the animated film Finding Nemo hit the screen in 2003. An estimated 30 million fish and marine creatures are harvested every year on the planet's coral reefs. There are no regulations about which species can be caught. The strong demand for aquarium fish has led to the widespread use of a destructive fishing technique, cyanide fishing. A solution of sodium cyanide stuns the fish, making them much easier to catch. This technique rapidly degrades the coral reefs. An estimated one square meter of coral is destroyed for every fish caught. Cyanide blocks photosynthesis in the algae that live symbiotically with the corals, depriving them of their main source of food. Cyanide, even in minute quantities, kills the polyps leading to the death and the bleaching of the corals. The practice began in the Philippines in the 1960s and spread rapidly. It's hard to calculate exactly how much cyanide is being used. Scientists estimate that over one million kilograms of sodium cyanide is spread on coral reefs every year. Cyanide fishing is against the law in a number of countries but enforcement is haphazard at best.
if you are fishermen, you cannot use all kind of techniques because there are regulations. But if you out in the sea, and Indonesia is so vast, nobody was watching you. So in practice, they do what they like with the techniques, yes. The deadly mixture for corals is obtained by simply dissolving sodium cyanide crystals in seawater. A fisherman has agreed to talk to us anonymously. What is the effect of cyanide? Cyanide stuns the fish. It makes them a little bit dizzy, so they're easier to catch. When we release the cyanide, the coral reacts by spurting out a liquid. Two days later, the coral has turned black all over, like it had been burned. Why do you uh, use uh, this on coral reef? Because with this method, all the fish crowd together, and all we have to do is gather them up. Back in 2000, I made $10 a day for four hours' work. Today, I make quite a bit more. I'd say I make around $30. Is there any risk for your health? Yes. If you breathe in the cyanide, it's very bad for your heart and lungs. International pressure has forced local authorities to take some action. But these few police interventions are the exception and often end without official sanction. Illegal fishermen have to receive three official warnings before being arrested. Arrests are rare and do nothing to discourage the practice. Did you get caught before? I got caught once. I was convicted of illegal fishing. I went to jail for six months and I had to pay a fine of $50. Indonesian fishermen also use this technique to catch fish intended for human consumption. Increasingly popular in Asia, the fish will be transported live to restaurants around the world, displayed in tanks, and served at premium prices. Fish that survive will metabolize part of the poison, but an estimated 80% of fish caught this way die from cyanide poisoning. The fish that stay alive, that are caught with cyanide, and they actually make it to the consumer markets, you know, there's not so much known about the effect of eating that. But many fish that are caught with cyanide die, and those fish are still sold, and they end up at the local market. So you can imagine that the local communities who eat that fish, because it's dead and they don't waste it, they actually probably have a lot of risk of taking a lot of cyanide that's still in the fish. That's what it died from, and they, they build that up in their body. But it can't be good for people. Another illegal fishing technique is devastating coral reefs. Blast fishing. This technique is fatal. It kills the fish and utterly destroys the structure of the reef. People use bombs to throw at big schools of fish and then they can just scoop up the fish out of the ocean. It's a very easy way to catch a lot of fish in not so much time. You just explode a small bottle. They usually use uh, you know, soft drink bottles. And if it's very close to the coral reef, you have a crater of about a meter. It's devastating. This fish, when it gets to the market, is damaged. So this goes to the domestic market. This is eaten locally. This explosive is made from fertilizer, according to a recipe that has been handed down through generations.
Is there lots of people around here who use uh, the blast fishing? Uh, Not as many as before, but some of us still do. Why do you use uh, blast fishing? It's easier to feed my family. This way I can harvest a lot of fish in a short amount of time. But now you understand the, all the damages that, uh, that uh, it will make to the coral reef. Yes, I know. It destroys everything, the reef and the fish. It's hard for the resource to recover. There are laws on the books banning all forms of illegal fishing. But in a huge country like Indonesia, enforcement is often sorely lacking. Fortunately, some people have decided to break the cycle of destruction. In the small village of Les on Bali, Made Partiana catches aquarium fish. Like the other fishermen in the village, Made used cyanide fishing for many years. When I was young, in the early 80s, the coral was brightly colored and healthy. But in the early 90s, the reef started to die. They turned black and gray. Money-wise, it was a true disaster. The fish had no more coral to shelter in and to feed off of. We'd catch fish for two months and then have to wait another 10 months before the stock recovered enough for us to catch any more. All the fishermen were worried. Then the government stepped in and placed a ban on cyanide fishing. None of us had any other way to make a living, but we still had to look after our families. Finally, in 2000, an NGO came along to study the situation and offered us a solution. They were very supportive. They taught us how to fish using nets. Made uses a long net that he sets out above the reef. He selects and collects the most beautiful specimens of all the fish in the net. Made holds his breath to a depth of between 4 and 10 meters. It's exhausting work, but he prefers this selective, sustainable approach that does not damage the reefs. What we are told that they, they already fish for ornamental fish since 80s. Now in that years, the early years, they're using the net, the mosquito nets. And then their exporter came to Les and they the one who introduced cyanide. Cyanide was brought to Indonesia by the Philippine uh, uh, fishers yeah, to collect the high value fish. So from say you know mid 80s until until late you know like 90s in the almost 2000s cyanide is being used. to meet you. Look at the blue one. Yeah. Cool. 
So this is one dive. Satu kali nyelam ya? Yes. Just wow. one. When did you start to work? Since eight. It's two o'clock, so now I've been working for six hours. What's the next step now? Langkah selanjutnya apa, Limadi? I will sort them out and put them in plastic bags with a little added oxygen. Then I take them to my buyer. You want to go with him to the middleman, Jim? Sure. Boleh ikut ke pengepul? Yeah. Okay. I'll get it all ready and we'll go. Okay. Okay. Pakai apa, Peggy? Okay, plastic. Made has to carry his catch safely to the buyer, who will check the quality of his fish. Oxygen stored in the inner tube is transferred to plastic bags to keep the fish healthy during transport. Over time, this exceptional fisherman has been able to create a real demand for his high quality fish caught in a net. Some village fishermen use boats and the most rudimentary of breathing aids. Their gear consists of a small compressor, a bit of tubing, and for a lucky few, a pressure regulator. Thus equipped, fishers can descend to depths of up to 40 meters. Diving is risky under any circumstances, even more so with inadequate equipment and little or no training. The compressor helps me dive deeper. I get a much better harvest that way. I've been careless and made some serious mistakes. Once, before I knew any better, I swam all the way to the surface without stopping halfway up. I had to be rushed to Denpasar and put in a hyperbaric chamber. A few years ago, some friends and I got the idea of sinking some old tires down to the seafloor as a shelter for the fish. I've only got one site today, but if I set up two sites, I could earn $40. I catch different types of fish depending on demand. The idea of making structures to replace the damaged coral is spreading. With the help of an NGO, the fishermen of Les have begun making concrete structures to replace the coral reefs destroyed by years of cyanide fishing. They have also started a program to reintroduce coral by transplant. Under this flourishing initiative, the coral ecosystem is gradually being reborn. The efforts of these reformed fishermen are being rewarded by a slow buildup of reef fish populations. Today, the whole community of the fishermen of Les has agreed to a complete ban on cyanide fishing in the region. The village is once again living from the fish harvest, but now it's all legal. Village fishermen bring their catch to Mr. Picasso, the local buyer. He also acts as the middleman who negotiates with international exporters. Every fish is inspected and evaluated to guarantee quality. One damaged fin automatically eliminates a fish from the process. Which one is the, the most precious one? The blue angel fish. It's around a dollar fifty. That's the price that you know the fishermen. Yeah, that's not Yes. So what's the price when 
you know, it goes to the, uh, to the guy in Dem Dempasa. This is quite a small one. I'll pay the local fisherman $1.50 for it. At Denpasa, I'll be able to sell it for $2. And then from Denpasa, it will go, it will take the plane. It will take the plane to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, and then after Hong Kong, they spread it to the world. US, Canada, Europe, you know, and then we have no idea what price could be. But the clownfish is the most popular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sangat. Yang paling banyak dicari yeah. uh, clownfish ya. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, most popular. I think it's about the movie. Yes, because movie. of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. What accounts for the price difference among various species? The price depends on how rare the type of fish is, and also how difficult they are to catch. Do you see a difference since 2001 in the types of fish caught and their numbers? Yes, a huge difference. Now that we've stopped using cyanide, the dead reefs are coming back to life. Slowly. The varieties of fish we hadn't seen for a long time are gradually returning. Before, with cyanide fishing, about 5% of the fish would die. Now the mortality rate is down to 2%. In one typical day, how much money you will earn? Typically, I earn maybe $7 on a bad day and up to $15 on a good day. It all depends on weather conditions, ocean conditions, especially the height of the waves. Made earns about 10 cents for a clownfish. The most expensive fish can go for up to $2, but they are few and far between. Fishermen naturally search out the most lucrative species, and yet they are often the most endangered. There are no regulations here nor any scientific monitoring to assess and track the state of marine populations. Mr. Pakasi's fish will travel to Denpasar, the capital. How many fish in this load today? On this trip, I have around 2,000. Usually, I have three times more than that. So in three or four days, if ocean conditions allow, I'll travel to Denpasar with 6,000 fish. And how many fish will survive the transport? The mortality rate is less than 1%. As a rule, if fish die during transport, it is due to human error. And of course, sometimes, the bags can burst during the trip. Middlemen who buy the fish are in a position to turn things around dramatically. By refusing to buy fish caught using cyanide, they will encourage the kind of sustainable fishing methods needed to ensure the future of coral reef ecosystems. But economic interests often outweigh good intentions. In the lucrative market of exporting fish for human consumption, there is still a lot of work to be done. If you catch fish with cyanide, they're not in a very good condition. You can imagine that if you have to ship them out for so many hours before they reach the market, many of them die. So we've always thought it doesn't even make business sense to use cyanides and, and you know, lose so many of your catch because it's very expensive to transport them. If you look at the uh, percentage of fish that is exported uh, now from Indonesia, uh, where you could say it's probably coming from cyanides, uh, it's still around 40%. That is much less than years ago, when I was just saying five years ago, I think the majority, maybe 80 to 90% came from cyanide fisheries, but it's still a lot. It's impossible to tell with the naked eye whether these live fish were caught using cyanide. But they are still widely available on the market. Cyanide is a powerful toxic compound that binds to hemoglobin, blocking the transport of oxygen. Though it may be difficult to assess its long-term impact on human health, the risk is real. Restaurants are not regulated, and patrons seldom have any idea of how the fish on their plate was caught. In a protected bunker, a food fish exporter who wishes to remain anonymous because of a series of threats 
has changed his ways. This exporter that we are today is actually a very special person because a couple of years ago he contacted uh, WWF and he said, you know, I'm in this business and I'm seeing that there are many, many practices that are not sustainable and I'm really worried about my business. What can I do? I don't know what to do. The exporter set up a network of fishermen who are restricted to net fishing. The catch is destined for big city restaurants. Using cyanide is strictly forbidden on pain of expulsion, and participating fishermen get better prices for their fish. The fish, especially groupers, are handled with great care by a team trained to the highest standards. This exporter doesn't buy cyanide fish, he doesn't buy fish that is too small. Uh, he doesn't buy fish that, you know, uh, has the eggs, is ready to spawn. So he does everything that he can do. I think he is the best example of, you know, a future where you can have a sustainable business and make money and support all these fishermen in these remote places. However, he's the only one and he's just by himself. And there's not enough support by the government to work on the other exporters that actually still have very, very unsustainable practices. The exporter has also designed oxygenated transport boxes so the fish can breathe better during long international trips. He has managed to convince some airline companies to accept these transport boxes equipped with an oxygen cylinder for shipping on cargo planes. This exporter's pioneering initiative doesn't please everyone. He has to operate under high security. Other exporters who use cyanide do not appreciate competition that breaks the mold. But the demand for clean fish is gaining ground and some restaurants are ready to pay a premium for a product that meets the highest standards. After eight hours in transit, Made's fish finally reached the second middleman, the exporter with an order book brimming with international orders. When the fish come in, usually they come in the morning. We open the bags, let them sit in the screening area for four or five hours. After that, we move it to a quarantine system. We keep them over there for a few days to see if there's any problem with disease uh, or broken fins, those kind of things. So after a few days of quarantines, we move them to our regular systems. So this is the place where we do the packing. Okay, now they are doing oxygen of uh, the fish. Uh, after that, they will move over there for, for putting in the box. I suppose that uh, because it's cargo mm -hmm. by plane, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So the quantity of water is important. Oh, exactly, exactly. Because we depends on where they are going and how long the flight gonna takes, we pack differently. The farther they go, we put more water, more oxygen, okay? If this is going to Asia, it's probably just a few hours flight, then it's less water. Smaller bags, of course, smaller bags, less water, less oxygen. So different place, different way of packing. Yeah, because of course, uh, more water, more kilo, more kilo, more money, Yeah, right? more, more expensive, yeah. <laughs> this is Pakesi, he's my good supplier. And every week he brings fish to us. Okay, so his fish is uh, all net carp, no uh, any uh, cyanide or any medicines. So we really like his fish, and we can see the difference from him and then the other other supplier. Oh, yeah. And is there a way that you can see if uh, a fisherman use cyanide? It's very difficult when the fish just come in and to to tell the difference between cyanide carp or net carp. So what we need to do is have a really, really good relationship with our supplier, and we know the history of the fish, and we can trust the supplier. 
and this of course need years to to build this trust this is nemo right yes and this is the new star when disney will release a new film dory mm -hmm. which is a blue tank right right that's true what was the impact of the film finding nemo on the business oh that was huge it was a big help for the for the business because everyone was looking for for nemos for, for this punk fish we think there would be a huge demand for this fish and we already prepared for it. Hopefully, in two years, they are, they are ready. You know, uh, we have a, a lot of stock for this customer. Aquarium fish, like food fish, are sent to the international airport at Denpasar every day. They then begin their long journey to international importers who will ship them to wholesalers around the world who, in turn, will sell them to retail shops or restaurants. So everything we see here are fish that are leaving. This is going to Munich, this is to Charles de Gaulle in Paris, and the crates that just went by are for London. Tens of thousands of fish leave every day going just about everywhere with different suppliers. It's clear that Bali is one of the major exporters of tropical fish to the world. The fish that very common is like a clownfish. Now clownfish, the increase of the price from the fishermen to the first buyer, the first middleman, they probably only twice more expensive. And then from the middleman to the exporter, they another double price. Now from the exporter to the importer, estimate probably they five times more. Okay. And then from, the, from that on could be like 20 to 25 times. But that's for the fish with a not high value fish. Now for the high value fish like angel or blue tang, that could be like a hundred times. That is really amazing. At every stage, the price shoots up. Made, the fisherman from Les, received only 10 cents for his clownfish. The market is expanding exponentially, putting more and more pressure on fish populations. Fish farming could help to meet the skyrocketing demand for both aquarium fish and food fish. Balinese entrepreneur, Mr. Chu, has an extensive operation. This reproductive center for exotic fish is one of the few to successfully breed some species of fish in tanks. Angel fish. And he can breed them. Yeah, he, he's breeding, it's like four, four species now. This is less damaging for the environment. I'm here every day looking after things. Mr. Chu has even been able to create his own variety of clownfish. Their distinctive markings make them even more valuable on the market. How many clownfish did he send around the world in the last year? Around one million. So what will happen uh, when they're going to release the, the new Disney film, Dory? These fish are very difficult to reproduce. So if I succeed, I'll be a millionaire for sure. Okay, yeah. I hope we'll be able to meet the demand with farm fish and leave the rest in the ocean. He really emphasized that if it happened, I mean, like, just took it from the breeding, not from the ocean. You know, it's more healthy, more, more beautiful. So good for nature and good for business. Thank you. <laughs> So what do we have here? This is Napoleon. Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon. Yeah. Okay, bisa. Napoleon fish numbers have dropped by 50% over the last 30 years because of strong demand on the food fish market. 
Despite an export ban, Napoleon fish are still on the menu in fine restaurants in China and Hong Kong. Unconcerned by their protected status, your chef will prepare a Napoleon the way you like it, for the tidy sum of 250 to 300 US dollars a kilo. When did he start uh, this program with Napoleon? The government of Indonesia started the program, but abandoned it. I took it over four years ago. It's an endangered species. We're trying to get them to reproduce. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a very rare fish. Yeah. It's under the, the CITES, yes. so it, it cannot be exported to other country. And if he's successful breeding it... For science, it's <laughs> going to be a great be victory. Great. Yeah. Convincing other fishermen to use sustainable techniques is always complicated. We meet with them and explain things, and they'll agree to start fishing with a net. But after a few days, they go back to their old ways. So now what we do is link up with one local fisherman, who then becomes our ambassador to the other fishermen in the area. But it takes time. Educating people, getting them to really understand, is a long process. So far, we've been able to set up teams in several areas, in different parts of Indonesia. Unfortunately, Nothing is black and white, so the problem is not black and white. You cannot say that these small-scale fishermen are criminals, you know. It's, for them, the amount of money that they make is very, very small. You cannot buy this fish for a good price and, and only pay, I don't know, a few percent of that to the fisherman who's doing all the work, and this is all he has. Something has to change in terms of, you know, the value that the fisherman gets. If he gets a little bit more, maybe, you know, he's also more careful with the environment. So it's important to understand who benefits most in this industry. And there's always, I think, a case to make that the fisherman who is responsible should get a fair price. Over a billion people depend directly on fish for survival. It's the most highly sought after source of protein on the planet. And the global population boom will only increase demand for ever more fish. To meet this ever-growing demand, we need to take a cold, hard look at the ways fish are caught to ensure renewal of the resource. Blast fishing and cyanide fishing, already banned by law, must be subject to heightened monitoring in order to halt the disaster now in progress. It is vital that we rethink our methods of harvesting the sea's bounty. Sustainable fishing practices that conserve the fish and their environment must urgently be established if we have any hope of ensuring our food security for the future. set sail for Lamalera, a small fishing village in Indonesia. Lamalera is on a mountainous volcanic island where the poor soil is not suitable for farming. Villagers depend for survival on a centuries-old hunting tradition, whaling. And their main target isn't just any whale. They hunt the sperm whale, the world's largest carnivore that can grow to a length of 20 meters and weigh up to 55 tons. La Malera is on the island of Limbato, one of the 17,000 islands that make up Indonesia. 
The earliest written record of this whale hunt dates back to 1643, when Portuguese explorers described it as heroic. People in Lamellera have always subsisted on what the ocean could provide. But with no nearby reefs or shallows harboring fish colonies, villagers must sail far from shore to cast their nets in the deep ocean. For centuries, fishermen rowed out to sea in their frail craft, hauling in anything that could feed the community. But these meager catches were not enough to ensure the village's long-term survival. So they developed a whaling technique using handmade harpoons. But in the early 2000s, a sophisticated new piece of fishing gear was added to the tackle box, the outboard motor. There are now about 30 outboards, and they've completely transformed what villagers still call traditional fishing. Sharks, rays, and dolphins are choice targets, and much easier to catch with motorcraft. While they still use traditional boats to hunt the sperm whale, motorcraft help in various ways. We depend on sperm whales. We do catch dolphins and rays, but without the sperm whale, the community could not survive. That's why we all pray that the whales will come back year after year. Whales are vital for the inhabitants of Lamalera. Without them, we die of starvation. Long classified as traditional subsistence activities, hunting and fishing in Lamalera are not subject to any quotas or bans on harvesting for the protection of endangered species. This exception to international law has not been reviewed since the hunters began using outboards. Villagers still consider their practices as ancestral activities essential to their survival. Whaling season begins in May. The whole village gathers to pray and commemorate the souls of those lost at sea while working at this dangerous occupation. At the beginning of every hunting season, the first formal event is a get-together. We call the beach meeting. We talk about various issues concerning the hunts to come. We might, for example, spend time discussing which team will harpoon first, second, and so on. We have to agree on that, or it will be a free-for-all. Then later that night, we make an offering of candles and flowers to the memory of those lost at sea. They are our heroes. May 1st is the day of the first whale hunt. The day begins with the blessing of the boats and the men. Then all the fishermen go out to sea to do their job.
traditional boats called tena, used to be propelled by oar or sail. But nowadays, the large craft are towed far out to sea where the whales can be found. There's a ban on hunting blue whales. But we're allowed to catch sperm whales and orca. We are dependent on waves and plankton. If plankton is abundant and the waves head towards us, then the whales will come to us. If the waves go out to sea, the whales won't come. The harpooner stands on a small platform in the bow. He has to leap into the air to plant his harpoon in the animal's flesh. It's an art, and one with considerable risk. It's a difficult and dangerous job, and results in many casualties. I've been hunting whales my whole life. I started when I finished grade school, and I stopped three months ago when I lost my leg. Some lose their lives. Others bear the scars of a battle lost in the name of tradition. During a hunt, there was a lot of confusion on the boat, and I ended up in the wrong place. I was standing with my leg in among the ropes when the harpoon caught in the whale, and the cable started to reel out, and I was thrown into the sea. When the cable between the whale and the boat tightened, it cut off my leg. It was a big whale, but we lost it. Whether the whale is large or small, it all depends on the harpooner. The harpooner is the most important person on the team. If you don't have a good harpooner, there's no point in going to sea. Even with a team of eight, nine or ten men, you have to have a good harpooner. A real harpooner has to be able to stand straight up at the front of the boat without getting nervous or feeling any fear when he sees the red eyes of the whale. A harpooner can't make a mistake. The rest of the team expects him to be successful no matter what. If there aren't many whales and I miss, I feel that I've let the others down. They rely on me. I feel an enormous sense of responsibility. It's a lucky escape for this killer whale. The harpoon fell out, and we're unlikely to see him again anytime soon. The most remarkable thing I remember is the time I chased down and harpooned three whales all in the same day. One of the whales was at least 15 meters long. All the boats were after it. Being a harpooner is a source of pride, mainly because it's a skill handed down from father to son. My father was not a harpooner, so I'm even prouder because of that. When we spot a dolphin, we come close and reduce speed so we can follow it. 
But it's tricky. Dolphins are unpredictable. They zigzag all over the place. I can catch up to 10 small dolphins a week, but if they're big, probably only five. The recently introduced use of motorboats has changed the way they hunt and greatly increased the pressure on a variety of vulnerable species. After another day hunting at sea, it's time to divvy up the catch among the crew. In a well-established distribution system, the harpooner and the boat's owner are allotted the best pieces. How do they eat that? Is it dry in, in the sun or? Bagaimana dimasaknya? Dikeringin dulu, baru dimasak. Tidak langsung. Ada yang kasih kering, ada yang langsung masak. Nak puasa. Okay. They can try it first, but it's, it's more delicious if you just uh, cook it right away. Obviously, for Westerners like ourselves, these images are very hard to accept because we have an almost emotional relationship with dolphins. When we come to places like this, I think we have to set aside our opinions, our Western point of view, to be able to understand this culture, even a little. But it's not easy. The numbers given by the harpooner are food for thought. If this one boat takes 10 dolphins a week, how many dolphins are caught every year by the Lamellera fleet's dozens of boats? And what is the impact on marine species now that motorboats are part of the hunter's arsenal? In this corner of the world, there are no scientists to track population numbers. Don't you think you're hunting too many dolphins? No, not at all. There will always be dolphins. Fishermen believe that their god knows what's good for them and would not put all these animals in their path if it wasn't right. Many boys aspire to the most prestigious job around. For generations, harpooners have commanded great respect here in the village because they contribute to feeding the whole community. For these youngsters, the dream of confronting a big sperm whale out at sea is very real. This is a day for celebration because they've just caught a young sperm whale. It's a young male. You can tell from the teeth. It's a male. Hard to tell the exact age, but uh, he's still fairly small. It's probably easier for them to catch the smaller ones. 
The main harpooner thrust the first harpoon into the whale. That harpoon is on a rope, and the rope is attached to a small wooden boat, which the whale now has to pull. Obviously, the idea is to exhaust the whale. Once the animal slows down, they'll come in closer and shoot more and more harpoons into it, attached to other boats. So by increasing the amount of drag on the animal and tiring it out, they'll eventually be able to deliver the dead blow. It's an ancient technique used by very few people anywhere in the world. It's been effective for who knows how many years, so they see no reason to change it. it was a difficult hunt. Is that so? Yeah. Uh, yes. It was very tough. Two of the 11 boats tipped. It took us an hour and a half to get the boats back in position. Other harpooners had to jump in to lend a hand. It was a difficult hunt. I'm a harpooner, and it's a dangerous job. So many things can go wrong. It's very risky. I could die at any moment. Is there more risk with a bigger whale? It's always risky, and accidents happen all the time. It doesn't matter how big the whale is. It's dangerous. We have to be really focused during a hunt. We harpooners have a rule. If we have worries at home, we do not go to sea. It's a lot safer. You don't want to take a chance. How many whales did the village uh, cut this year? This year, we've caught 25. 25? That's a lot, isn't it? No, it's not too many. If we could catch more, we would. We need them. They're our survival. We're not going to empty the sea by catching 25 whales a year. They're a gift from God. There will always be plenty of whales. We use every part of the whale. Nothing goes to waste. That shows just how much we need them. We have a saying here that goes, we should all have food to eat, not just our relatives, but everyone. When the pieces are cut out, the women roll them in salt and then hang them to dry. That way the whale meat will keep for months. Yeah, hello. The whales are our livelihood. We depend on them. A single whale will feed the community for a month. Half my share goes to my mother-in-law. I also give some to my neighbors and to the widows. We also traded for corn, one platter of corn for three strips of whale meat. Sometimes we also traded for bananas and manioc.
The treasure will be divided according to a precise ritual. The crew that first harpooned the whale claims the choice pieces, but the whole community benefits from this manna from the sea. Tomorrow, the chief will come down from the village and the head will be set aside for him. The oil will be shared among the members of the village, but the head is always reserved for the chief. The next day, the villagers begin cutting up the sperm whale's head, which contains the precious spermaceti. So this is the head of the sperm whale with its single blowhole, which is to the right of center. That's typical. So the blow is always at a slight angle. They will cut off the part of the head that contains the spermaceti, a very valuable oil. Sperm whales are part of odontoceti, or toothed whales. They have only one blowhole, unlike baleen whales that have a double blowhole. The blowhole is off-center, and within the structure is where you find the spermaceti oil. When the whale is alive, its internal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, so the spermaceti is in liquid form. Originally mistakenly identified as the whale's semen, the name sperm whale is derived from spermaceti whale. But below 30 degrees, the spermaceti solidifies into a spongy wax. The sperm whale controls its internal temperature and can alter the density of the spermaceti organ to act as ballast when diving. The oil can be burned in lamps and was used to light village houses right up to 2006 when electricity reached La Malera. At the end of the process, everything has been cut, dried, salted and stored. All that remains of the animal are a few bits of skeleton that the tide will soon wash out to sea. Life goes back to its usual slow pace until the next whale kill. This was the 25th sperm whale killed in just the last four months. At a conservative estimate, we're talking about several tons of food per slaughtered whale. In addition to the dolphins, rays, sharks, swordfish, and other fish caught every day. Yet. The total population, including the surrounding area, is no more than 2,000. Every Thursday, the women of La Malera attend a market in the neighboring village. Here they can pick up things they need that the ocean does not provide. The road linking the villages, not built until the early 2000s, affords a mobility that has begun to open up the world. Goods and commodities of all kinds can now be transported more easily, but it takes money to pay for them. While barter is still common, villagers increasingly want to sell their products for cash. In the market, we figured that a package of whale meat like this, that contains two or three pieces, is worth about one dollar. So whale meat is not uh, worth much compared to other types of fish or even some vegetable that are not very common here, like carrots. But what doesn't get sold, the woman will try to barter for something else. <laughs> She's traded this for a root vegetable and she'll do the same here.
Hello. It's really barter. They're trading root vegetables for pieces of whale meat. Not so long ago, whale meat was the basis of the local economy. But access to modern equipment and the free circulation of goods have altered life on this Indonesian island. Motorboats now set drift nets that catch vast numbers of fish. With modern technology being used to scoop up ever more marine life, some environmental groups have begun to question the legitimacy of traditions, especially where endangered species are concerned. When I look back and compare the situation now to previous years, I'd say the catch has really gone down since the late 1980s. As far as protecting species is concerned, it's a noble cause. But I firmly believe that the resource will be here for hundreds of years to come. We've always lived off what the sea gives us, and that includes whales. Some time ago, some people came to talk to us about protecting whales. But no one on Lamalera agrees with them. What we are doing is legal. The International Court of Justice permits our traditional hunting practices. We fishermen work very hard. Sometimes we work almost 24 hours a day. We will never stop hunting the way we do, the way we've always done. Not long ago, the local government tried to make us give up hunting, but we refused because this is traditional hunting and because all of the equipment we use is made by hand. No one can stop us from doing this. It would be an insult to our ancestors. It may be hard to accept that this can still qualify as traditional fishing especially compared to the way things were done before outboard motors came on the scene. They chase a killer whale, but the animal is fast. Dolphins. This time the boat was able to catch up to the fleeing animal. When we go out to sea and harpoon a dolphin, what we see is not a beautiful, intelligent animal. What we see more than anything else is an animal that, once we get it back to the village, will feed our families.
We believe it's important to strike a dolphin's snout to shorten its suffering. That technique has been passed down from our ancestors. During one maneuver, disaster strikes. The motorboat has struck the harpooner, causing a serious head injury. John, can we go to Ulandoni, because the, the, the local hospital near nearby, like just in front of the of our boat? We quickly get the injured man to the village. On the way back, another unforgettable event brings a difficult day to a close. A crew member spots a familiar shape, and the boat makes straight for this shadow on the surface. The sight of an enormous manta ray sends the hunters into a frenzy. They struggle mightily to capture the animal. Since we arrived, we've been wondering about middlemen, foreign buyers who might be reselling some products of the marine harvest. But no one was prepared to discuss it. The standard response was that what happens here is subsistence hunting and fishing, not commercial. Our rescue of the wounded harpooner may explain his sudden and surprising willingness to talk. For us, Manta rays are a better catch than dolphins. In addition to their meat, there's also their gill rakers. The gill rakers bring in a lot. We get $50 a kilo for the gill rakers. We have a buyer here on the island. He sells them to a middleman who ships them to China. For shark fins, it's different. We have another buyer who ships them overseas. We get a lot of money for them, too. We know that Chinese importers pay a great deal of money for the gill rakers. Did you know that the manta ray gill rakers you sell for $50 a kilo go for $500 a kilo on the market? That's a big surprise. $500 sounds like a huge amount. But for us, $50 a kilo is still a tidy sum. The devastating effect of middlemen is well known. We've witnessed it firsthand in several countries we've visited, where locals sell products to international buyers for resale in Asia. The price for shark fins or gill rakers from rays is skyrocketing, as is demand. In China, too, tradition is trotted out as an excuse when these delicacies from the sea end up in soup. In less than 15 years, La Malera has undergone a dramatic transformation. A road has been built, electricity has been installed, and gasoline-powered outboard motors have made things easier for fishermen. Progress has opened up markets, and some local products now make their way to China. So it's been a good night's fishing on uh, La Malera. Here on the beach this morning we find many different species, swordfish, mai mai, but there are also a lot of fish that are on the endangered species list. 
This morning we see a number of species of shark. There are dolphins, a lot of rays, and especially hammerhead sharks. Worldwide stocks of hammerhead have dropped by 98% in the last few decades because of overfishing. But here there's an exception because of traditional fishing. It may be time to ask how far we're prepared to go in respecting cultures when we're talking about endangered species. We're also beginning to feel that uh, we're wearing out our welcome here in the village. I think they'll start urging us to uh, ship out pretty soon. They seem to be uh, more and more annoyed by the camera. So this may soon be the end for us on La Malera. In the US and in Japan, they use modern industrial fishing methods that really do endanger whales. That's not the case with us. But they want us to stop from hunting? Why don't they make them stop and leave us alone? If people think we're overfishing, they're not being fair. We go to sea to hunt in a traditional manner. We hunt and fish whatever we can find. If people are bothered by the way we do things here, that's their problem, not mine. Our point of view usually depends on our values and our culture. It's easy to condemn, and for many of us, often our first instinct. But putting an end to the whale hunt will have major social consequences here. On the other hand, can we accept the status quo with no scientific tracking and oversight? Beyond any ideological position, one question remains fundamental and universal. How far are we prepared to go in harvesting species that are threatened with extinction? mission 1000 days for the planet is to document the beauty and fragility of biodiversity on earth but we also realize that life in the oceans is truly threatened oceans cover more than 70 percent of the earth's surface and their volume is about 300 times more than land-based environments so the oceans play a vital role in the balance of life on this planet life abounds in the big blue in a variety of shapes and colors ranging from microscopic creatures to the last giants of the world. Unfortunately, our limitless exploitation of the oceans and our savage history with certain resources tell a sad tale. After nearly wiping out whale populations, we have developed ever more sophisticated fishing techniques, which have exerted an unsustainable pressure on ocean resources. Today, it is estimated that 87% of the oceans are overexploited or exploited to their very limits by the fishing industry. Large ocean predators have been especially affected by our insatiable appetite for resources of the sea. It is estimated that 90% of large fish have disappeared in recent decades. Despite their threatened status, the fishing industry still harvests about 65 million sharks each year. The sharks were long considered an accidental catch or bycatch on long liners, fishing boats that release kilometers and kilometers of fishing line into the sea aimed primarily at catching large fish. The sharks are no longer a bycatch. Today, they are targeted directly. In the past, there was no market for shark meat, but the recent development of the lucrative Asian market for shark fins has completely changed all that. 
The consequences for ocean ecosystems are disastrous. There are recent scientific publications that say that, in general, all marine predators have declined 90% in the last 50 years. So, you know, it's, it's not looking good. We've invited scientists aboard the Sedna, people who are passionate about what they do and who have dedicated their lives to saving the ocean's large predators. Biologists Pedro Afonso and George Fontes have joined the Sedna Four for this expedition. These scientists from the University of the Azores are also skilled fishermen who are able to catch a shark with a line and hooks specially designed not to hurt the animal. They will team up with Rando Arauz, a scientist and activist who has become well known internationally for his campaigns against shark fishermen, especially those who practice shark finning. Our first stop was the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. It's a place I love. It's filled with history. It's a sailor's paradise. On the beaches, the docks, even in the bars, you can feel the history and smell the sea. Sailors love to stop at the small port of Horta on Fayal Island. Located on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Azores Archipelago is the result of 20 million years of volcanic activity. The spectacular scenery of the islands, which have emerged only 5 million years ago, continues to evolve and change as a result of volcanoes and the movement of three major tectonic plates that meet here. In the oceans, seamounts rise up to the surface, which brings up nutrient-rich waters that feed an impressive diversity of marine life. In seamounts, you typically have upwelling um, events, that is, deep water that carries nutrients along the slopes of the seamount to surface or at least to depths where the animals can profit from it. Seamounts not only have more biomass or so more animals, they have more species, including the top predators that might be travelers of the ocean, but that might stop on particular seamounts because they have the increased productivity which they can profit from. Everybody goes to the seamounts, including men, of course. Many migratory species appear to use these seamounts in some phase of their lives. But only recently have scientists discovered the important role played by seamounts around the world. We could probably try to do that like again, like at four. One of the very first seamounts to be declared worldwide um, as a marine reserve for scientific purposes, so we can understand the whole process from bottom to top is the Condor Seamount, which was declared a marine reserve about three years uh, ago. And this is just, just outside Aldor, which is a fantastic opportunity for all of us, scientists, fishermen, and managers, to understand how these seamounts work so we can better protect them. The volcanic seamounts in the Azores cause nutrient-rich currents to rise to the surface, which attracts pelagic species such as hammerhead sharks, whose status is precarious and which are increasingly rare in the world's oceans. Hammerhead sharks are among the most endangered sharks. All pelagic sharks are reduced 90% during the last 50 years, but hammerheads are down 98, 99% in certain areas of the world, so they need a lot of help. The crew of the Sedna Four hopes to install satellite tags on young hammerhead sharks that seem to use some areas of the Azores as a nursery. Hammerheads are naturally less abundant because they produce much less offspring to start with. Secondly, they uh, actually um, make what we call some kind of parental care to their offspring in the sense that they move to very specific habitats where females think that their pups are going to have increased chances of survival during their first uh, months and, and years. So the nurseries of, of, of hammerheads are typically located in these very coastal areas, shallow um, uh, inlets, uh, mangroves in the tropics. In the particular case of this hammerhead species, the smooth hammerhead, we think that oceanic islands such as the Azores might play a crucial role as nursery habitats for the North Atlantic population of this species.
In places like the Azores, there has been no historical fishing pressure on hammerhead populations locally. And this continues to be the case, fortunately. However, the adults which live an oceanic lifestyle are also attracted to the long lines, the industrial long line, in open water. And they are indeed uh, a bycatch, a typical bycatch of this fishery. And that is exactly the reason why now ICAT has mandated the member states to forbid any landing of hammerhead species on the long line fleets. There is an era of research on marine ecology and behavior before the advent of electronic tagging and another one after the advent of electronic tagging. The capacity of these devices to open windows into the life of these animals and into the significance of particular habitats is just too precious for us to leave it behind. That's a female. That's a female. A hold for years, maybe. We think this site is a nursery, so we're going to attach an acoustic transmitter to this female so that we can find out whether she comes back next year. So these guys, they heal really fast, this kind of wounds. Yeah. We've attached the acoustic transmitter. We're going to move forward to oxygenate the shark and then we'll attach the satellite transmitter. This satellite tag, called a pop-up, is quite distinctive. After 300 days, the tag will be released and rise to the surface, where it will send all its data to the satellite. This will provide detailed and accurate information about the shark's dives and how deep it went. And if it traveled any long distances during these 300 days, we'll learn that too. Okay, whenever you want. One, two, head first. Three. Woohoo! Without knowing it, this female will be providing scientists with vital data. They'll use it to learn more about her movements and eventually to help put protective measures in place for this extremely threatened species. To study the ocean's great migrators, we must travel great distances. With the same team of biologists, we're headed for Coco Island off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Coco Island is a paradise for both biologists and divers who come here from around the world. The marine biodiversity here is exceptional, and it's known for its abundant shark population. The sharks of Cocos Island migrate between Cocos, Galapagos, and Malpelo, Colombia. So it's really a shared population. This is very important because, of course, we can protect the sharks in Cocos Island as much as we want, but then they're going to go to other islands and they must be protected there as well. And also, let's say all three countries get together and say, okay, we have to protect them more when they're on these three islands, but what about when they're migrating in between? So we need the information now on when are the times where the sharks are migrating so that we can design, of course, the, the corridors. Uh, 
Our goal is to install a satellite transmitter onto a hammerhead shark. If we're successful, we'll gain a much better understanding of where these sharks go, and we'll be able to suggest protection measures. It's very urgent that we gather accurate data on the shark's migration routes, so that we can adopt effective conservation measures. Catching a hammerhead shark will not be easy. They are very cunning animals, and there are fewer and fewer around Cocoa Island. And because there are many different kinds of sharks, our bait may attract other species. But it's very important that we get a satellite transmitter onto a shark to better understand how they move around in this area of the Pacific. There are many illegal fishermen around here, and we must put conservation measures into place quickly. Fortunately, you know, the government of Costa Rica recently increased the protection around cocos. They're taking stronger actions against the illegal fishermen. I really hope we can curtail all these illegal fisheries and that we can somehow control, you know, the uncontrolled fisheries that are happening now in the eastern tropical Pacific because hammerheads definitely have dropped during this last year. The decline of shark species is caused by overfishing, prompted largely by the demand for shark fins, which can fetch up to several hundred dollars per kilo. There is a 12-mile protected zone around Coco Island in which no fishing is allowed. Obviously, the extraordinary biodiversity here attracts many poachers. We see them sitting just outside the 12-mile limit on our radar. The island has a monitoring system, wardens and boats, but they can't do anything when the poachers are outside the park. Yet we know very well that these poachers frequently enter the park because they have no notion of conservation. All they want to do is catch fish and sell it. When they come into the park, they often play a game of hide-and-seek with the park wardens. At night, it's the law of the jungle. And the poachers are much better at the game than the wardens. So at night, out at sea, there's a war going on. On the island, the evidence of poaching is striking. You see it everywhere. For example, this bridge across a small river was made from fishing boards seized by park wardens. The director of Cocos Island National Park agreed to talk to us about this serious situation. This is where we store all the fishing gear. We can see here a number of different kinds of buoys. Do you see how many of them are painted? They do this to make them almost invisible and difficult for us to spot. We keep all the confiscated equipment here. As you can see, there is a lot. It's a big problem because it's all equipment that was set up in protected areas. We manage all of this as garbage. This here is the gear typically used by longliners. These are the lines and hooks used to catch shark. You know that the Cocos Island is also known as Shark's Island. Even our emblem is a hammerhead shark, and they are now an endangered species. There are pressure zones that are between 8 and 10 miles from the coast. The fishermen know when we're coming and sail off. So by the time we reach the point where we first spotted them on radar, they're gone. And that's where we find all this fishing gear. Sometimes they've even had enough time to cut or retrieve their lines by then. We say that fishermen are like sly hunters, an exotic species introduced into an environment into which they don't belong. And even though it's a big ocean, the ecosystem around the island is especially rich. 
la riqueza está ahí, ahí donde están los animales, sí, pero nosotros no podemos tener... We can't keep the fish in cages to protect them. Cercados, ¿verdad? Encerrados. Aquí donde tenemos This lo, is las where boyas, we keep the boys we retrieve. Las boyas pelican, ¿verdad? Las boyas pelican prácticamente... Most of them come from Taiwan, and they paint them so they can sneak past the patrols. Look at the difference. This is one that hasn't been painted, and this is one that has. With the painted ones especially, we can clearly see the intention behind them to harm the protected area by fishing shark and tuna. We need to reevaluate our strategies to counteract this problem. We're not here just to patrol and protect. We need to take it further and work on reforming our fisheries and navigation laws. Necesitamos eh, una ley de, de navegación y es un lugar con mucha con mucha vida marina. This is a magnificent place with a wealth of marine life worth protecting. That is the least we can do with what we have. We must quickly develop new protection measures here in the island and at a national level to protect the resources. The team of scientists continues its efforts, but the days go by and the large numbers of hammerhead sharks that Cocos Islands is famous for are still missing. The team decides to change the protocol. At this point, any species will do. The scientists must absolutely catch a shark for their research. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing the same number of hammerhead sharks. I used to see hundreds at the different stations in Manuelita, at Dirty Rock, and Alcion. And about three trips ago, last year in September, we came, and there were hardly any sharks, but the water was very warm. And everybody said, well, it's El Nino, the water's warm. The sharks will come back as soon as it gets cold. And OK, um, but yeah, the water's a lot colder now. and. They're not coming back. There was a place like this in Mexico, the Gulf of Cortez, and they had hammerheads just like here, and they wiped them out in the 90s. You know, they can be wiped out. The scientists have tried everything. They spread blood in the water to attract sharks, use baited buoys, anything to catch a shark. One particular night was extremely frustrating. We were trying to catch a shark for science, and yet on our radar we saw poachers coming into the park and setting their lines. And they probably had a better chance of catching a shark than we did. There was nothing we could do except alert the wardens. They said they would try to stop them, but we knew very well that their chances of catching the poachers were slim. So we have a boat. Do you see the boat there? At what distance? It's about 12 miles away. It's about 12 miles away. It's leaving the Cocoa Island National Park limits. Are you heading right out to look for them? Yes, we're going straight there. Earlier, this boat came within three miles of ours. Clearly, it was completely inside the park boundary, so the fishing equipment could be just about anywhere. What they do is cast their lines, then leave the park limits. What they do is cast their lines, and then leave the park limits. They'll remain outside at the 12-mile limit, where they cannot be caught. An important point to explain in all of this is that if we reach them, we will most likely find fishing here. But unless it's connected to the boat, we cannot prove that it belongs to them. The fishermen see us patrolling because they have radars like ours. And as soon as we start off towards them, they move further away. 
no podemos decir que ese equipo de pesca and so we can retrieve and confiscate the equipment este, but unless the boat is right algo, there no there is no way to prove anything so unless the lines are actually connected to the boat you, you can do nothing even if the lines are only a meter away and full of fish exactly for example, we can accuse them of illegal fishing, and two or three years later, the case will end up in court. But when the judge asked the park ranger if he saw that the lines were connected to the boat, if the answer is no, and the captain denies that the lines were his, then the case is dropped. This is one of the biggest problems we face here in a Cocoa Island National Park. We know what the problem is. We just need to change the law so that every fishing boy is identified with a boat number. That would solve the problem. If a fishing boy is found inside the park with your boat number on it, you're guilty, period. Along the coast, measures to protect birthing areas are not much better. The team joins another group of scientists in Golfito Bay, in Costa Rica. The Tiburon mission team is studying the life cycle of young hammerhead sharks that gather in this bay. The biologists are working directly with some local fishermen to try and provide protection for female hammerhead sharks who give birth in the area. During the months of July and August, is when there is a jump in the number of, specifically, young hammerhead sharks being captured. This just confirms that it's the season in which female hammerheads migrate to the coast. They probably come in May or June and leave their pups to grow in this protected area because it is a safe nursery, rich in nutrients. Here they can live for their first two to four years until they're adults, until they can make the great migrations to other islands, such as the Malpelo and Galapagos, where adult hammerheads are often seen. This is our reality here in Gulf of Dulce and other areas along the coast of Costa Rica, where the hammerhead shark is often unintentionally caught by fishermen as bycatch. One of these fishermen has agreed to talk on camera. On average, how many hammerhead sharks do you catch every day? Depending on the area, in one day we can catch up to 100, sometimes more, in other areas, none. But whenever they're caught like this, most of them are already dead, up to 70 percent are already dead. These aren't illegal fishermen, they're simple family fishermen trying to make a living. But for two months, they fish right in the shark nurseries. The problem with this species is that it spends most of its time swimming to oxygenate itself. When these sharks get caught in the fishing lines, their movement is limited so they can't breathe and they quickly die. That's why during those months fishing in this area must be prohibited. Sixty-three, forty-eight, macho, male. Es un It's a newborn. It still has the opening from the umbilical cord. It's sixty-three centimeters in length. Hammerheads are born between fifty and sixty centimeters. That male is two weeks to a month old, no more than two months. He's ready for relax. An interesting fact is that in the Gulf of Dulce, there are more male than female hammerheads. It may be a strategy to ensure genetic diversity within the species. Come on, come on, go! He's stunned, but he'll recover. The capture of this young tiger shark is not good news. 
Other endangered species also appear to use the Golfito area to give birth among the mangroves along the coast. We're trying to protect the adults in their migrations, but we're leaving behind the young in the coastal waters. It's sad because we work hard to try and protect the hammerhead. And when we see these things, we become discouraged. It kills the flame. But at the same time, it's the reason we keep working. We need to know more about them to protect them. We need to work closer with the fishing communities to make their protection a reality. In Puerto Jimenez, there aren't many traditional fishermen, only around 20 to 30 families whose livelihood depend directly on traditional fishing. There are a lot of options in the area. There's a lot of tourism. There are even many other marine species during these months, like whales and dolphins. And these can provide some alternatives, like tourism. We have to work with the fishermen so they understand that the hammerhead is endangered and that these sharks are worth more alive than dead. You're free! The biologists of Mission Tiburon are doing fantastic work. They raise awareness with young people and fishermen, but it will take more than that. We need laws to protect the sharks' birthing sites and nurseries for these two critical months of the year. And we need to find a way to financially compensate the 20 or so fishing families during this period. It shouldn't be that hard. It probably costs more to send scientists somewhere in the world to meet two or three times to try and understand the problem than it does to implement real measures to compensate these fishermen. But we must absolutely find a way to protect the zones during these two critical months. The conservation problems in our oceans are caused mainly by overfishing. Governments know it, and scientists have been saying it for years. Even worse, scientists are saying that we have maybe 40 or 50 years to change our ways, or fish stocks will collapse. So if the overfishing problem isn't solved early in this century, there will be no more fishing at all by the end of the century. Longline fishing is non-selective. And every year, its bycatch kills a huge number of non-commercial fish, turtles, birds, and other species. One longliner can deploy up to 100 kilometers of line equipped with thousands of baited hooks. This type of fishing primarily targets large fish, such as swordfish, which are a good source of income for fishermen. But overfishing has reduced stocks to the point where revenues are not sufficient to cover the cost of the industry. The significant decline in swordfish populations has forced the industry to develop new markets. Long considered bycatch, sharks were once thrown back due to their low value. But the growth of the lucrative shark fin market has changed the strategy of the industry. There's very little known about sharks and shark science only started until the 90s. And I think all shark scientists now share the concern that we're running out of sharks and we really need to work together to generate the information we need and to get the political change we need. And One day, Randall managed to get a friend hired on as a cook on a fishing boat. The images he took documented for the first time what happens at sea, far from prying eyes. The footage shows turtles and all sorts of bycatch, but the most disturbing images are of what happens to the sharks. These were the first images of what's called shark finning. In its most barbaric form, the shark is brought on board, its fins and tail cut off, and then it's thrown back to the sea, often still alive. Obviously, without its fins and tail, the animal can no longer swim and circulate water through its gills, so it dies an agonizing death by suffocation. It's a cruel practice, and these images galvanized public opinion.
First of all, it's a cruel, painful death for these magnificent animals. Uh, from a more technical point of view, it's unsustainable. They're wiping out marine biodiversity so that a culture on the other side of the world can have their shark fin soup. These images of shark finning helped raise public awareness, and some countries now ban the practice. But this has not stopped shark fishing altogether. What happened is that a new market has been created. Many countries now require fishermen to keep the shark carcasses. In a way, by creating a market for shark meat, we have legalized a once condemned practice. But nothing has really changed. We're putting even more pressure on shark populations. The way fisheries are controlled out here in the open sea, it's no man's land. It's everyone take all. Everything is for free. And that isn't changing yet. And I think that is something that many countries have to work on. The United States, the Economic Union, Australia, which is a big fishing nation. And, you know, we need to get together and change the way fishery policy is established. We have a very interesting relationship with the government of Costa Rica. However, we have a very bad relationship with the Costa Rican Fisheries Institute. The Fishery Institute is an autonomous institute, which means it's not part of the central government. And since it's autonomous, they are not ruled by the president. They are ruled by a board of directors. And guess who's on the board of directors? Shark finners, shrimp trawlers, tuna purse saners. So they're all there not to establish public policy. They're there to protect their own private interests. What we need is fisheries directed with science in mind. How many boats can fish this resource? When should we stop fishing? Where should we not fish? Then even if it hurts somebody's pocket, we must stop fishing. The fishing fleets have grown in the past decades dependent on subsidies from governments. That is, the real cost involved in sending a fishing vessel out there with all the costs in fuel, in gear, in paying the crewmen, etc., is just not uh, overturned by the real profit that the catch is going to make in the market. And the only reason why that fleet or that particular vessel is doing its everyday fishing is because it gets subsidies from all of us taxpayers to lower the cost of those, uh, uh, of those items. If we would be to take all the subsidies to the fishing fleets all over the world, and in particular in developed countries, most of those fleets would stop the day after. By creating a new market for shark meat, the fishing industry is committed to using much of the resource. But at 63 euro cents per kilo, less than a dollar, some wonder whether this new market for shark meat is not simply a cover for continuing the lucrative trade in shark fins. to catch a shark off Cocos Islands continues. Time is passing, and the scientists are redoubling their efforts. Pedro and George have been working day and night. There's no question of giving up. They can't leave empty-handed. The stakes are too high. If we want to effectively protect and conserve these highly migratory species, we need to figure out where the critical habitats are located, whether they are for mating purposes, for spawning purposes, or for juvenile growth purposes. This is the main issue. Finally, after many attempts, they catch one. It's not a hammerhead, but the team can still track its movements and learn the migration routes of this Galapagos shark. Vertebrates in general have this thing called the tonic immobility reflex, which basically is when you're turned upside down, you become numb. And they get really, really, really uh, amenable to work with. Um, and we think that they also get a decreased uh, pain function. We do that to promote natural anesthesia. Okay. 
Yeah, more ever. That's the tag. This is a female Galapago shark. Uh, they just installed an acoustic tag inside it. This issues a sound that can be heard 500 meters around. And this tag will work for at least five years. So we expect to get some really good data because the tag is implanted inside the animal, so we're sure it's not going to be lost. Yeah, go for it. Quick action is needed. The scientists install the satellite tag. Okay, bottom one. Let's just keep going for a while. Yeah. Well, the shark looks a little tired, and it's you know it's already been hooked for a few minutes, and I'm just a little concerned that you know the time it'll take to deploy the satellite transmitter on it might be a little too long. It is very invasive, but then at the same time, the, the information you get out of a single animal is so valuable compared to using other type of tags. But on the other hand, it's very invasive, and yeah, you have to act fast. Usually, after the first stage of the operation, we turn the shark over and move the boat to oxygenate the animal. This revives it from its comatose state. But this shark wasn't reacting. We began to get anxious. Okay, so see you guys. Okay, yeah, good. That's the direction is good. They're holding now. In the end, it was just a scare. The female Galapagos shark regained her senses and swam off with the transmitter. So she will provide a lot of essential data for scientists. In the days that follow, divers managed to install acoustic transmitters on other shark species, including one of the few hammerhead sharks spotted around Cocos Island. This glimpse into the world of sharks and fishing really makes you think. Scientists have identified most of the problems, and solutions do exist. But if we want to save these threatened species, what's missing is a willingness to implement those solutions. This will probably mean making sacrifices and changing our consumption habits so we can change the model and build a different relationship with the oceans. If we want to preserve what remains of our oceans, we'll have to pay the price for our past abuses. I think there is no miracle solution to the biggest problem of all, which is how are we going to give uh, food to everybody while wild fish are just going low and low in numbers? Um, there is two main uh, hopes in our capacity to solve that. One is aquaculture, but we also know that aquaculture has a lot of environmental and even social problems associated with it, and we need to solve those. And the other is obviously a more sustainable management of global fishing uh, in the world. And that might take the exploitation of lower trophic chain resources, which can still give good protein to people and release a little bit our pressure on the top levels. So balanced harvesting is becoming a major hope in the fisheries science arena. We talk about sharks are going extinct, how important they are for the ecosystem, you know, and we go to meetings and we go to conventions and we design strategies and then we have meetings to see what went wrong with the strategy and then another meeting to, to push the strategy again and this time it is going to work, you know. So all this talk and talk and talk, but no action. Apparently we don't have time. Scientists are saying we have another 40 or 50 years before it's all depleted. In our lifetime, 
We may see this big dramatic change and let's hope we can stop it. We need everybody's help. There are serious conservation challenges, but I'm optimistic. When humanity mobilizes, we can accomplish great things. We mustn't forget that everything on Earth is interconnected. We depend on other species for our own survival. If we can change the way we coexist with other species, I'm convinced we can get there. We can do it, I'm sure. With every dive, we are struck by the extraordinary biodiversity of the oceans. The goal of this mission is to document this biodiversity and appreciate its astonishing beauty. But we are also seeing the fragility of the balance between species. Unfortunately, we are in the process of quickly destroying what nature has taken millions of years to perfect and adapt. The extraordinary diversity of life on Earth is expressed in a variety of shapes and colors. The result of slow evolution, plant and animal species interact in equilibrium to form the great tree of life. Present in our waters for probably more than 400 million years, sharks are valuable predators that contribute to the vital balance of the oceans. However, nearly a third of the 64 species of sharks and rays in the world are now threatened with extinction, mainly due to overfishing. And they are not alone in this unenviable list of humanity's victims. Sea turtles have likely inhabited the oceans for over a hundred million years. Of the Earth's seven species of sea turtles, six are on the red list of species that are threatened or vulnerable. Among the oldest creatures of the sea, turtles have survived all of the natural disasters in Earth's history. But today, they are threatened by pollution, poaching, loss of critical habitat, and accidental entrapment in commercial fishing gear. In the space of just a few decades, humanity has managed to endanger the world's sea turtles, species that have withstood every other assault in the Earth's past. Fortunately, scientists all over the world are organizing to develop effective protection and conservation measures. We headed to Coco Island, famous for its pirate legends and the hidden treasure from Spanish ships that is said to be buried here. It's why we also call it Treasure Island. But for scientists, the real treasure is found in its exceptional biodiversity. Located off the coast of Costa Rica, in the Pacific Ocean, Cocos Island is a veritable paradise for divers and scientists. Known for its abundance of sharks and turtles, Cocos Island is home to a remarkable diversity of marine life. In these crystalline waters, the crew of the Sedna Four were able to capture their first turtle, a real challenge for the divers. This green turtle will become part of a large research program to determine the migratory route of the species. The power of a green turtle's flippers is truly amazing. They are excellent swimmers, and their evolution has produced a huge muscle mass around the flipper joints. Obviously, this makes catching one a difficult operation. This feisty male is refusing to cooperate but the scientists have met his kind before. This turtle will be equipped with acoustic and satellite transmitters, which will help us better understand the migratory routes used by the species. Once we got the turtle aboard the inflatable boat, 
We brought it to the Sedna 4, where a team of biologists was waiting. We have a special lift for large animals, so we lowered it into the Sedna's workshop, where biologists could attach the various transmitters. We invited two eminent turtle specialists on this trip to Cocoa Island. They often work in this region of the Pacific. These biologists became activists out of necessity because they firmly believe that taking real action in the field is the only way to change things. Oh, let me see. Is there any 4062 there? No. Biologist Randall Arouse has devoted much of his life to the protection of sea turtles. He is accompanied by Todd Steiner, a biologist with the Sea Turtle Restoration Project, an organization dedicated to the conservation of sea turtles and their habitat. Todd and Randall organize yearly scientific expeditions to Cocos Island to monitor turtle and shark populations. Okay, we hold it here. Take the measurements and then you do the tagging and I'll tag her. And you okay. can tag her and I'll. Yeah. Okay, so hold her there, Chipo. Okay. Okay, put this right there where the skin starts and the shell ends, right, like right there. Okay. 74 and a half. Yeah, 74 and a half, yeah. Let's say 74 and a half. And with. Okay. What do you got? 72. 72. This is the first time we've caught this turtle. Hasn't been marked before. We're putting a tag on now, permanent tag. Yeah. Okay. Check the lock. Check. Perfect. PE three one two. Where, where are you going to do it? Same place. Wait. Right. Okay. It's locked. PE three one three. This is an acoustic tag, and these are the same tags we use for the sharks. And since we already have a system of, of listening stations around the island for the sharks, then we use the same system for the turtles. Okay. Okay. We've had turtles with the tag on for over a year, uh, sometimes a few months. And you know, so you know, sometimes it seems like they're pretty permanently in there with you know cables and everything, but you they do fall off. Yeah. In the old days of sailors, couldn't keep fresh meat on board for very long, so they would stop at islands like this grab turtles, put them on their back, and they could last for months. Come down once a week, just pour some water on it to keep it from drying out, and then they could use the meat as they needed. So turtles played a major role in uh, the exploration of, of the world. Okay. The green turtles of the Caribbean that people are more familiar with are purely vegetarians. They eat turtle grass, which is an algae. So they grow very slowly. This satellite transmitter will send a signal up to a satellite up in space, yeah. and then that will send the signal to my computer, and I'll know right where this turtle is every day. We're trying to understand what the migration routes are. So when this turtle's here at Cocos Island, it's protected because there's a 12 nautical mile no fishing zone. But as soon as it swims out of that, we don't know. It could get caught on a fishing line and be killed. So our goal is to understand where these turtles go and then create marine protected swimways. So if they're swimming to Galapagos, we want to connect their swimways. We want to understand their migration routes and be able to protect them by closing fishing areas. So as you're doing that, yeah, we want to try to keep it kind of as, as hydrodynamic as, as we can. We've had turtles go as far as Panama, We've had turtles go to Costa Rica. We've had turtles go to Costa Rica and then swim up the shore all the way to El Salvador and then head back out to sea. And a lot of our turtles like it in Cocos and stay right around here. The juveniles, or the young ones, they definitely stay here for a number of years. For instance, we have turtles that we tagged here two and a half years ago, and they're still there in Dirty Rock, for instance. So the young turtles live here, and the adults just swing by, and then they take off and continue their migration. There are different policies to protect turtles, for instance, special hooks, circle hooks, which they're less likely to swallow. But 
the best way to, is to protect the ecosystem, protect the habitat that they need to live. So if we can close those areas to fishing, then we'll have turtles for our kids to see and our grandkids. After a few hours, our guests can return to the sea. Randall and Todd check that the transmitters are working so this Pacific green turtle can regain its freedom. Now, now we have to be careful with the satellite transmitter. So let's do that. The transmitters on this green turtle will provide scientists with data on its movements. Okay. I'm basically, yes, in love with turtles. This adult male has nothing to fear within Cocos Island National Park, but the protected area extends only about 12 nautical miles around the island. Beyond this border, turtles and other migratory animals of the island risk getting caught up in the baited lines of the long line boats. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> I think we can say mission accomplished. The data gathered by the satellite transmitter will tell us more about the turtle's movements and may one day be used to establish protective corridors and areas where fishing is banned. But we must continue to raise awareness because there's still a lot of work to do before these essential conservation measures are put in place. The Sedna heads for the Guanacaste region of Costa Rica. Known for its white sandy beaches, the area attracts tourists from all over the world. Beaches are an essential habitat for our planet's different species of sea turtle. They have served as egg-laying sites for millions of years, and they are vital for their survival. No beaches, no turtles. It's simple as that. But in recent years, beaches have undergone major changes, due mainly to a population boom of one species in particular, human beings. Not only do we use and transform beaches for recreation, but real estate development is constantly destroying this essential turtle habitat. Once female turtles reach sexual maturity, they return to the very same spot where they hatched to lay their eggs. This may be 15, 20, 30, even up to 40 years later in some species. After all those years, the turtles often return to find the beaches occupied by houses, lights that disorient them at night, or hotel patios. So the turtles often have a hard time laying their eggs safely. The problems of coexistence between sea turtles and humans are not new. You have to go back well before the arrival of tourists and the Costa Rican real estate boom to understand the origins of the problem at a time when the beaches were a meeting place for local villagers. They did not come to enjoy the white sand and the waves. In fact, they would come mostly at night when turtles came ashore to lay their eggs. Some Costa Ricans still remember that not-so-distant past when local traditions contributed greatly to the decline of the turtle population. What do the leatherback turtles mean to you? I feel there's something beautiful. They're so natural to me, a part of my life that I would never want to disappear. I remember that when I was young, my dad used to take us to the beach. He would say, Let's go to the beach to collect eggs. It was normal to do that? Yes, but only to eat, never to sell. It was part of the culture? Yes. What was it like with the leatherbacks in those days? It was beautiful. There were so many of them, so many leatherbacks. 
It was incredible to see them on the beach at night. Biologists used to say that the letterbacks would disappear, but we didn't believe them because there were just so many. Every season they'd say that we needed to protect them. And they were right, because we started seeing less and less. The economic hardships of those days played an important role in the illegal collection of turtle eggs. While the consumption of turtle eggs has long been a family tradition, it is their trade that continues to cause irreparable harm to turtle populations. Poachers can still fetch high prices for turtle eggs, and this threat is not a new phenomenon. One repentant poacher agrees to talk about it. Those were very hard years for everyone around here. There wasn't much work. And most people dedicated themselves to agriculture and animal farming. There was very little money to be made working the fields and fishing. So people had to find a way to make a little extra to help support their families. And an easy way to make money was by collecting turtle eggs. It was well paid. I also did it. You'd set up a stake and then walk 50 to 100 meters, maybe even more, and then put up another one, which meant that all the turtles within those boundaries were yours. In just one night, Around 200 to 300, maybe even 400 leatherback turtles would come. Nowadays, sometimes one or two, maximum five come. People would come to the beach, wait until the turtles laid their eggs, and collect them. On your way out, the egg buyer would be waiting on the street. In one night, you could collect 100 to 120 dozen eggs, and in some places more. If I remember correctly, they'd pay 400 colones, sometimes up to 600 per dozen. So as you can see, a hundred dozen at 400 colones was good money. We just met two policemen, and of course, I took the time to ask them about the problem. They obviously were reluctant to talk in front of the camera, but what they told me was clearly that there are poachers, especially in the area on the other side of the bay, and people are selling their eggs throughout Ostional. Ostional is a place about two hours from here where there are huge beachings of turtles, and there is a big laundering of turtle eggs in Ostional. They say all the eggs come from Ostional, so it's okay to sell them. I'm told that there are bars where for one dollar you can have a cold beer with a beautiful turtle egg with Tabasco sauce. They drink it and it's ecstasy. So the community still has a special relationship 
with these eggs. Rodney Piedra Chacon is director of Las Bolas National Park. Rodney and his team will spend the night on a small, isolated beach. Another long night spent protecting turtles from poachers, seeking to steal the precious eggs. Tonight, I'm going to take you to one of the most important beaches for green sea turtles, at least in our country. It's called Nombre de Jesus. It's a very beautiful, undeveloped beach by a forested area. It's a great nesting ground for this species. To protect endangered species like this one, it requires commitment from everyone. We all understand that there are many interests at stake, scientific, community, development, and fishing interests. Nonetheless, it's very important that we find a common goal so we can support each other in this struggle for conservation. Reducing poaching to protect the eggs is an essential factor for conservation. Is the only way to access the beach? By vehicle, yes. This is the only route. There's a way to get there by foot, but you have to go over a mountain, so it's difficult to access. This is tricky. Maybe through the middle. One wheel there, one over here. Listo. Made it. <laughs> In our country, there are protected and unprotected areas. At present, this is a very important nesting ground. So to ensure the conservation of this species, we're putting a lot of effort into creating a management strategy for this area. We organize ourselves every night on the beach. One of the first things we do is walk the whole length of the beach together. This way, we can get an overall idea of what is happening on the beach, of whether there are people and turtles or not. The idea is to have some time to calmly analyze the situation. When we find tracks, we stop and follow the trail to see what the turtle is doing, and immediately we all get to work. Those lights over there, what are they? The main reason we all come together is so the egg poachers see a big group of conservation workers and know that we're here to back each other. We think they may be egg poachers. So we'll have to be more careful from now on.
We decided to use the night, too, to witness the spectacular sight of green turtles laying their eggs. But in certain areas of Costa Rica, it's not a good idea to walk the beaches alone, because poachers are still very active. So we decided to accompany a team of biologists from Las Bolas National Park in their work to protect egg-laying sites. In recent years, Turtle egg poachers have started working with drug traffickers in certain areas of Costa Rica. Poachers can earn up to $300 a night by selling eggs on the black market. The eggs are worth about $1 each on the street. In 2012, a heavily armed group of poachers got into a turtle egg nursery, a place where turtle eggs that have been collected by volunteers are placed until they reach maturity. The volunteers were tied up, and the poachers made off with over 1,500 eggs. The message is clear. Poachers do not want turtle conservationists on their beaches. We'll start by measuring the length and then width of the shell. You can check on the other side to see if the turtle has a metal mark or tag. If it does, read out the identification number so she can log it. I'm going to dig a bit so we can see better. It's a little complicated right now because there are many roots. Do you want help? No, no, that's all right. Today we're going to move the eggs to a different location here on the beach. So you'll be able to see how we move them. If this were a protected area, the nests would remain untouched because there would be 24-hour surveillance. But at this time, we can't protect the beach 24 hours a day. So we have to move the eggs to a safer location. How many are there? There are 56 at the moment. How long does it take? She can last 10 to 15 minutes. She's still laying eggs. Is the turtle in a kind of trance as she lays her eggs? Yes, actually. All turtles go into a trance-like state in order to be able to shift their muscles to lay their eggs. <laughs> That's why. When she's done, we have to leave because she starts moving. very moving. Oh yes, it's amazing that she does all this work. A half hour of preparation and she closes it up all with great care and the eggs are not even there. She does not even know that eggs are not there.
What we're going to do now is bury the eggs in another location on the beach. The others at this time are digging the cavity where we'll put the eggs, a spot we consider much safer. How deep will it be? The idea is that the depth of the nest has to be similar to the depth the turtle gave it, so between 45 and 50 centimeters. Once we've reached the right depth, we'll carefully place the eggs into the cavity. What's great is that, for generations, these young people would normally have learned to become poachers. But this is a new generation, and their mentality has changed. It's the young people who are taking things in hand and trying to save the turtles. It's great. After, we'll place an aluminum tag that will allow us to identify the nest in the next 45 days, when the hatchlings emerge. Now, we'll bury the nest. And Luis will pack down the sand as best as he can to protect the eggs. After that, we will mark the nest in relation to that stake over there. If the poacher find the, the little uh, stick... What we do now is bury the tag in the sand so that when we find it, we can see from which nest the hatchlings emerged and which turtle laid those eggs. That's how we can determine what this turtle's hatching success was in regards to this nest and all the nests. Of these 82 eggs, how many will make it into the water? The hatching success last season was between 80 and 90 percent. It's great to see young people involved in protecting turtles. Their work on the beaches will save many turtles, but will, above all, help change people's mentality. This is essential if we want the new generation to change their ways and condemn poaching. I think the new generation is ready to do everything it can to protect these threatened species. There aren't many egg poachers left. And then, what has changed? People's mentality. And the fact that Tamarindo has developed into a tourist destination, creating more job opportunities. What's your job now? I'm a tour guide. After poaching, many of us became tourist promoters, and we learned a bit about the biology of the turtle. There are far fewer poachers on the beaches around Guanacaste now, especially since Las Bolas National Park was created. Today, tourists come from all over the world to witness turtles laying their eggs. But poaching is still a serious issue in some areas of Costa Rica, and illegal egg trafficking still threatens the survival of turtle species. If we want to save them from extinction, we must continue to educate people. 
Our objective is to maintain the turtle population that nests in the area. And to do that, we need to make sure those legs are laid and hatched here. We believe that our efforts are essential if we want to preserve such an important and beautiful species. How do you see the future? I believe that we're very committed. And we're convinced that we can recover these populations. It's been a very long process trying to educate people. It has required strong commitment. But by the number of people now getting involved, I think Costa Rica is becoming more environmentally conscious and committed. Not just the organizations, but the communities themselves are becoming involved in protecting their resources. They are becoming empowered by making this struggle their own. I think the fact that we're out every night, six or seven hours, trying to save these nests is so very important. I know we might not see the results of our efforts in the short term, maybe not even in our lifetime, but most likely our children will see the results in 20 or 30 years. And they'll know that all the efforts of conservation made by those who started this were worth it and that they must continue. Bueno, vamos a dormir. Vamos a dormir. Vamos. Por favor. The magnificent Playa Grande Beach in the Guanacaste area is a favorite destination for day tourists. But at the end of the day, the tourists must leave because the beach is now a protected area. After nightfall, no one is allowed on the beach with the exception of a few biologists and volunteer patrollers. At night, this beach belongs to one of the oldest and most remarkable creatures of the sea, the leatherback turtle. At high tide, this female leatherback turtle comes ashore to lay her eggs, just as others have done before her for millions of years. For over 20 years, the organization The Leatherback Trust has protected the turtles of Playa Grande. Biologists James Patilla and Frank Palladino have been part of the organization since its beginning. In all those years, they have fought many battles. It's an animal which has a flexible shell because it's not hard bone. It's got little bones with cartilage in between. It's got a leathery shell, that's, that's where it gets its name, a, a skin like a dolphin on the shell and on the flippers. It has a pink spot on the middle of its head, which is where the pineal gland is. It has some signaling for hormones. The skull's only half as thick there. They can dive a mile deep like a whale, so the shell collapses when they do that gets compressed, and they only eat jellyfish. So they must be our friend, we don't like jellyfish. Um, she looks to be about 145 centimeters long, probably around 18 to 20 years of age and she's finished nesting. She's now in the process of early burying. But you can see how delicately she's yeah. using her hands to pat the sand down and to pack it so that the eggs are in a nice location. And then she will start to camouflage and cover all around here. So when we came here, the number of turtles nesting per year was 1,500. And then it declined exponentially, so by big steps. To the present time, there's about maybe 50 nesting a year, but it's bottomed out the last three or four years, so we think that we've, we're about for, due for a comeback. The new turtles that we see now are as a result of these students and volunteers who are on this beach for 20 years. 
And so, yeah, those, those are our turtles who are coming back. You have an opportunity to see a dinosaur come out of the ocean and do all these very intricate behaviors. And I don't think there's anybody who ever walks away from this beach after seeing this experience that hasn't been awed. The first time we came on the beaches here, uh, Frank Palladino had to pay the local poacher for permission to work on a turtle after he took the eggs. Then he was okay if we studied the physiology of the turtle. After the park was founded and we got more involved and Frank taught the people English and we taught them some biology, now those poachers all became guides, ecotourism guides, so they make more money, cleaner. Now at this point, their children are the guides. Right now, this is a national park. There's national park guards. We have very good protection. There's an occasional poacher, which is usually a stranger who's come into town, and a lot of times they're uh, uh, Nicaraguans that come down here to work on construction of homes and so on, and they want to make some quick money so they can catch a bus and go back home and visit their family. But for the most part, the local people are no longer the poachers. As a matter of fact, whereas before they were against the park, it is the local people who are the strongest supporters of the park. When we first came here, the people used to be poachers. They hated us. They didn't like us in the local village. Now we're friends. Um, our students are friends with, with the young people. I think it made a big difference. So the, the people see that these turtles are a benefit to them. I think it's very important. This work of Frank Palladino, James Spotilla, and countless volunteers is truly inspiring and proves that mentalities can be changed. But in certain areas of Costa Rica, much work remains to be done. For example, in 2013, a 26-year-old biology student named Jairo Mora Sandoval was kidnapped from a beach in Costa Rica along with four other patrollers. Drug traffickers and poachers were fed up with turtle protection campaigns and wanted their beaches back. That night, the young biologist was tied up, beaten, and shot in the head. Jairo Mora Sandoval died simply for wanting to protect a threatened species. This tragic story made headlines around the world, and environmental groups responded by offering a reward to find those responsible. The government of Costa Rica has promised an inquiry. The protection of turtles and beaches is often spearheaded by the work of passionate people and volunteers who come from around the world to get involved. Unfortunately, the weapons of poachers everywhere are often intimidation and violence. We must continue to highlight and support protection efforts and encourage volunteers to patrol the beaches in order to change people's mentality. This is probably the only true hope for the future.